Thank you all for being here today. Um, and to keep this kind of speed networking moving, I'm going to change the focus a little bit and talk about some of my broad research activities as it relates to aging. Um, and I'm thrilled to kind of share with you my overarching theme of my research, which is creating age-inclusive environments. First, a little bit about myself. I'm a social and environmental gerontologist um, that focuses on the predominant social and built environments that individuals live. Looking at social in terms of who we interact with, how we interact with them, why we interact with them, and the built environment focusing on where do we live, why do we live there, where do we travel to, how does that, and how do those combinations affect our overall health and well-being as we age, and more importantly, how can we use that information to develop systems, programs, activities that can improve overall health and well-being for our aging population and individuals across the life course because we know that uh, health in older age is the cumulative effect of everything that came before it. In short, my work aims to create the optimal personal and environmental fit for the most ad advantageous health outcomes as we age, and, but we'll kind of get to more of that in a moment. Really, as I focus on my work, this is kind of the, what I consider the key diagram, really going into the fact that we're focusing on the individual and the networks and places in which they live. Because we can't expect people to change their health outcomes, as, Judy's, as uh, Dean Karshmore mentioned. We can't expect them to take on new activities if we don't first understand what they're currently doing, where they're currently at, and how those, those activities, those experiences are influencing their health and well-being. And to me, the key, right, the key is the center, where we're able to identify that unique activity, that unique program that can improve health overall for our populations. The aim of this, of course, is to create a more equitable society for aging for all people, which is easier said than done, right? Um, and to do this, I actually take a disease agnostic approach, or a disease-free approach, meaning that Unlike, some, unlike other researchers, I don't really focus on a particular disease, I focus on populations, that population being older adults. And I focus on what the individuals I'm working with and the older adults I'm working with tell me that they want to focus on. And one of the benefits of that has been that I've been able to work across diseases, conditions, populations, groups, states, countries, to really kind of identify what are these commonalities, what are these strengths, what are these opportunities that we have. And I do this predominantly through working with underrepresented rural and sexual and gender minority populations. Um, really, once again, emphasizing how can we stop othering one another but understand more about our collective experiences. And like many in this space, I particularly have started working a lot more with caregivers, individuals living with dementia, and really looking at these structural systems and how we can change them. And while I could spend a lot of time kind of going into more, a lot of details of my work, I kind of wanted to highlight three overarching areas that I think you might find interesting. The first one is the Finding Ease in Caregiving study. And this is a study that we are conducting right now with caregivers of individuals living with dementia. And it's a virtual study. And actually what we're doing is we're working to help caregivers think about a new way um, to act and respond. Often when we respond to something in a caregiving situation, it's an immediate response. We're not necessarily processing why we're doing this. It's just kind of ingrained in us. With the Finding Ease in Caregiving study, we're actually using improv improvisation techniques to encourage individuals to rethink and kind of rewire how they respond in caregiving situations. We've actually been one of, you know, I hate to say that good things came out of COVID, but one thing that did come out of it is we were actually able to move this online. And what we've actually found with this being one of the first online approaches to use this technique is that we're not only able to reach more people, but we're actually having some better outcomes online than we did in person. Um, where preliminary data has shown that participants have reported greater ability to create and think about new things, that they're have, they report reduced stress and increased understanding of what their care recipient's kind of going through. And we do this really with the aim of the improv. There's this idea of like the one second delay. So before you respond, you pause you, and you just do a one second delay before you do something. And we, we've um, really excited to continue this work and hopefully within the next year be able to share more about it and expand it. 
I also do work at the intersections of social networks and caregivers. So the social network and caregiving study is actually a two-phase study looking at the influence of social networks, meaning who we know, why do we know them, what do they do for us, like how, who, why do we go to them, on individuals' caregiving journey. And we're, take, we're talking to caregivers, once again, of individuals living with dementia to understand their roles, their experiences, their challenges, and who they go to when they have a question about what doctor should I go to? Is this a good place for my loved one to go to? Or this is a new symptom, I don't know what's happening. We're trying to identify who they go to in part so that we can understand what is the ideal combination of supports that will result in the greatest health outcomes for individuals. Because we know that those people in your networks have a lot of influence on what you know. And so if you don't know someone who has access or has awareness of these services, such as um, access to health care or um, other things, th then it's really a challenge for you to be able to change your behavior or to, to identify them. We're actually very excited to be launching um, a second phase of this, which we're calling GeoSocial, uh, GeoSnack, where we're actually going to track where people go and why they go there. Because one thing we also know is that you may say, like, I get most of my support in my caregiving journey from this community group I go to twice a week. But then if we actually like follow you around, maybe you go to that community support group once a month. And so where are you really getting support from? So we're wanting to combine the understanding of where individuals go and their social networks with actually what they're doing. And we, to, use, to then use this data to understand more about how we can improve access to health services. And we're excited about this, particularly as we can expand into rural areas, because we know that's an area where definitely people often refer to services they're, ask, they're accessing, but it's often a challenge to access those services. And so often when they say they're accessing them, they may not be accessing them as much as would be ideal. We also have a wing that focuses on a series of um, LGBTQ aging. We know that our LGBTQ population um, old, over age 50 will more than um, double in the next 10 years. And so we've had a series of studies collectively focused on the experience of the aging LGBTQ population. Um, and work in this area has really identified how can we understand more about the needs of this population as they age? Because the social service systems and the aging service systems that are set up haven't been designed with them in mind. And so how can we increase their ability to navigate aging? As well as the realities of limited caregiving opportunities, perhaps the lack of family connections. And so for a, care for a society that has built an emphasis in older age on caregiving, if you don't have individuals to provide care to you as you age, what do you do? Who, who has the authority to enact your advanced care plan if you don't have family? We're also looking at this from the, ter um, the focus on the demographic transitions, such as challenges around uh, the outcomes of HIV AIDS and the loss of 400,000 gay men in the 1980s and 1990s. And then, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about some of the work we're doing at ASU. ASU is very lucky in that we aim to give back to our community, and we do, we're doing this through two new exciting projects. The first is a longitudinal study of health outcomes associated with lifelong learning, and this is through the OSHA Lifelong Learning Network. ASU has one of 120 lifelong learning networks in the United States. And then the other one is focusing on Mirabella, which ASU has one of the first university-based retirement communities actually on a college campus. And so we're working with residents there to identify how is living on a college campus really influencing intergenerational connections, particularly as we know that college students have a lot of what we call gerontophobia, meaning that they're afraid of aging. They're afraid of older adults. And so how do we build those intergenerational connections? And then I want to mention one thing that was already, that has been suggested, but about 20 years ago, we started the age-friendly ecosystem model. And about 12 years ago, ASU, along with international partners, founded the Age-Friendly University Global Network. Um, back, in, it existed for 12 years, over 110 universities has, have joined, and we're really excited that after 12 years of being housed at Dublin City University in Ireland, that as of August, the Age Friendly University Global Network has moved here, and we're coordinating these international aging efforts for a collective impact to improve engagement of, of older adults um, throughout the university systems. And so I'm happy to talk more about all that. That's a very 
very brief overview of kind of the work we do, but thank you all for being here.